Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening. Whenever it is that you are watching this video, a very warm welcome to my channel. Please make sure you are subscribed and haven't been unsubscribed. Or indeed, if you've never seen me before and you're interested in learning more about galactics, ascended masters, angels, higher perspectives on what's going on around our earth, etc. Uh, do subscribe. Thank you very much. So what we're going to be doing today is having a look at a really interesting subject. Also a subject that seems to produce a lot of confusion. So I'd like to clear up that confusion. Uh, the subject is invisibility cloaks. We are going to be looking at a number of different methods for putting one on because I'm putting that in brackets because actually what we are dealing with is energy and magic and in particular with regards to energy um, as a human being what we tend to need to do a lot of the time is to visualize energy in a form that makes sense to us that we can identify as belonging to something, in this case, protection. Um, but ultimately, the methods that I'm going to give you with regards to invisibility cloaks um, aren't always in nature about actually putting on a physical cloak or imagining that. Um, all will become clear. I will timestamp this video so that if you re-watch it at any time, you can go straight to the material which is about the three or four different methods um, in terms of how to do it. But before we get to any of that, we have to cover off some of the basics. And these basics are linked into um, the considerations of using a magical practice um, the whys and wherefores, the things to do and the things absolutely not to do. Some of them should be really uh, common sense, but equally often when we are delving into other realms and other frequencies, uh, we can sometimes forget that we need the structure and we need rules uh, as we do in any other area of life. So as an example, you know, if you had put on an invisibility cloak and then you've forgotten to take it off and you get into a car, that's not really very sensible, is it? So that should be a common sense thing to not do that in certain situations. Very much, you know, if you just think about invisibility, when would it be appropriate? When would it not be appropriate? So we're going to cover off some of the ethics and some of the do's and um, don'ts. Uh, I'm also going to take a lot of your questions, um, and although this is not being recorded as a live, I have got, I don't know, probably about 100 questions that have come in via Facebook and Instagram on this very subject, because I asked for them. So uh, again, towards the end of this video, I'm going to rattle off as many answers to those questions as I possibly can. So shall we begin? Let's begin. Oh, the other thing to say is that the energies that we're going to be particularly working with on this video are the energies of Commander Ashtar and Merlin, and of course Metatron, who's always around as well. I have to say that I knew that I was going to be doing this video on invisibility cloaks for about a week or so, but I just haven't been able to find the time to sit down and record for all sorts of reasons. Today is a day where I can record videos. I was lying in bed thinking, come on, get up, have your shower, have your breakfast, get going. Pulled the curtains open and uh, the first thing I saw was a cloaked ship that looked like that in the sky. <laughs> and it was like, oh, hello, Ashtar, how are you doing? Um, it was just such confirmation that... Uh, this was the day to talk about this. So yes, we're also going to talk about um, the galactics and why they cloak their ships as well. But let's try and keep this as structured as we possibly can. Um, and let's first of off talk about invisib invisibility cloaks, why you would need them um, and why now. Now, I first mentioned this subject on a video probably linked into the war. Um, in the Middle East at the moment. It came in as a piece of information for people who are literally in a battle zone. 
uh, in a war zone, in an emergency situation. Uh, and, you know, so it's important to remember why spirit reminded us of this uh, form of protection, because it's a form of protection in an emergency use setting. But equally, the more that I've been sitting with this and tuning into spirit over the past week, I see that there are also a number of different situations day to day, um, which I think using an invisibility cloak from time to time can be useful. Um, one would be, for example, in the energy of if you've got a child going to school being bullied. But I do want to also talk about in this video about um, time frames of using it and when it can become detrimental because you don't want to get to a situation where you're just hiding your child away um, forever in a sort of sealed bubble. Um, that's not going to help their development, their social skills, getting out there in the world. But from time to time, for example, with bullying, maybe break time or on their way to school, back to school, assuming that they don't have to cross roads and things like that, um, it could be appropriate. But can you see how this is much more complex than it first appears? Because even in that scenario of maybe um, asking uh, Merlin, Metatron or Ashtar to cloak your child if there's severe bullying going on to and from school, if they're going to be crossing roads, yeah, you, you, it's, it's a, it's a diff well, that, that would be an inappropriate uh, use of it because it could put them in danger. So I think more than anything, before we start, let's just have a moment to respect um, the art of magic, which I think particularly on social media platforms, which is very much sort of give it to me quick, 24-7 <laughs> society, on to the next thing. Sometimes we forget that the subjects we're talking about are steeped in ancient mysticism. It's a lost art. It's an art that used to be um, shielded from public eyes in mystery schools. Um, it wasn't something that everybody had at their disposal. Um, but again, these aren't ordinary times that we're in, but we have to respect magic and acknowledge the fact that we are actually invoking something that has great power. And like any form of magic, if it is within your hands, you have to be using it only for good. So to use an invisibility cloak for something which is uh, detrimental to somebody else um, is, is I don't know, to do with spying or snooping or to get one over on somebody, that's going to come back to you tenfold, okay? Um, there is a consequence of using it inappropriately. So I want to really just set the record straight on this, help you as much as I can, and let's talk about this subject now. So grab a cuppa. You might also want to grab a piece of paper and write some notes, and we're going to go through this. So let's start firstly then. Let's start actually by bringing the two guides in. We're going to bring in Ashtar, who's very much all already here, and we're going to bring in the energy of Merlin. So let me just first acknowledge their presence and thank them for uh, bringing this subject up for our uh, common good today. So first of all, Ashtar, just welcoming his energy in. This is the Commander Ashtar spray. Welcome, Ashtar. As soon as I spray it, I just get this huge, expansive feeling in my aura and also in my mind. It's as though he's saying, um, let us expand our minds in terms of what is possible. Um, we live in what often can feel a very limited universe. We limit ourselves. We limit our capabilities. We shut down so many different facets of our multidimensional selves. Let us open them all up, okay? Let us open them all up to have this discussion, to remember the power of different techniques and tools that are given to you. Um, it feels as though, put it this way, only people who are meant to find this video are going to find this video. Um, so... 
that's that that's that feels very true. It's got to be respected. Okay, so we have Ashtar here. Let's now bring in the energy of Merlin. I love the fact that we've got an energy of as above, so below with these two guides as well. So let's just bring Merlin in. Okay, and I, I always see him in the same place. Um, <laughs> he's he's always standing in this I think it's a nod to the Merlin series on TV actually but um, you know take whatever works at the end of the day is what he's saying if that's where you wish to see me that's where I am so it's the kitchen that Gaius used um, in the, the TV series Merlin that's how I always see him but he's he's in that kitchen and he's um, wanting to begin and he's there's actually an energy of haste to this okay so let's begin and he's got all of like I've got on my desk he's got all of these pieces of paper and the old books the old manuals and again it's a nod to the fact that this isn't something that's just like give me the piece of information and then I'm just going to go and do it you have to understand what you're doing uh, this is wisdom that is passed down, is what Merlin is saying. This is magic that has been that is being passed down, and he's um, agreeing with what Ashtar's just said, which is that it finds the right hands, and this video finds the right eyes that are ready for this material. Okay, right. Um, let's start then with a little bit of ethics, um, the do's and don'ts, and I've written some of them down. Um, here we go. So I was trying to think about situations when it would be appropriate to put on an invisibility cloak. Um, now, also I'm getting the Harry Potter reference, of course, in my mind as I'm talking to you as well, because many people know about invisibility cloaks from Harry Potter. But again, you know, that book or those series of books were absolutely channeled books. Whether J.K. Rowling knows that or not, I don't know. Um, I'd be interested to do a um, a, a video on her, actually, um, a spotlight video on her. But it definitely channeled information in a lot of those books because a lot of the techniques that she presents as story time that Harry experiences, that Harry learns are actually real. You know, they are real. And the invisibility cloak is one of them. OK, so the whys and wherefores. When would you use one? When would you not? Now, this is not going to be an exhaustive list. Help each other out in the comments as well. If I see something which looks like a real red flag in the comments in terms of somebody saying, oh, yes, use it in this situation. And I'm getting one of the guides coming in and saying, no, no, I will come in and just um, not meaning to correct you. But I feel as though I've got a responsibility with this video. OK, uh, but yeah, let's all just help each other out. Let's explore this whole subject. Your experience is also of when you've used one, when um, would, would be helpful, I'm sure, to other people as well. In fact, this whole video kicked off because of that. Um, it, uh, it was via a comment that had been sent in by one of you. And thank you very much. I can't remember what your name is, but you are a follower on YouTube. And you said to me, dear Amanda, yes, it is not crazy. I remember a remarkable story by Immaculate Ilbigiza in which during the Rwandan genocide, she and another six women were locked hiding in a bathroom. Militias came into the house searching for her, but didn't find her. She says it is, it is as if they didn't see the bathroom door. In fact, she had been praying that they wouldn't. I've also met a Ukrainian refugee who was staring down a Russian tank in a forest. She was in her car with her family and she just closed her eyes and drove and when she opened them, the tank had gone. So thank you, whoever you are, um, for that beautiful uh, comment, because you've triggered this video, which is going to help so many people. Uh, but yeah, appropriate settings then. War is, is a given. So unfortunately, we are at times of war in our world again. I was shown a situation um, in my mind's eye, it felt like it was Gaza, but it could be Israel, it could be anywhere else around the Middle East of, uh, God forbid, you know, um, snipers going door to door, that type of thing, hunting people down in that type of situation, invoking invisibility cloak, very much like our commentator here on my channel has just said, 
it's possible for them to literally just not see you or to pass by the door, to pass by that particular house. Uh, Metatron show me an example. I'm being shown something here of, um, I'm not being shown where this is going to happen, but it, I feel as though I'm going into the future a bit. It's as though there's a sniper on a street. They're walking down the street. They're going from house to house. And it's as though when they get to the particular house where somebody's invoked the invisibility cloak, there is a distraction or is there, is, there is a noise elsewhere in the road which confuses the sniper or whoever it is and they forget that they haven't gone to that door. It's that type of scenario, okay? So again, God forbid we don't want to be bringing anything in, but we also are, we cannot be blind to the fact that there are wars happening all over the world at the moment. So in war would be a legitimate use for it um, to protect yourself, to protect your family. Um, also, I was being shown this morning the situation, for example, in South Africa. Um, I haven't done a reading on South Africa recently. I know I've got a lot of followers there. I will try to do that as soon as I can for you. But I was being shown the farms that um, I don't know whether they still be are being taken. I know they certainly were being taken uh, a year or a couple of years ago. But again, um, that type of situation. So people hiding from... Uh, militia basically coming in to take your land, take your property, take your lives, God forbid. So those are the heaviest situations, I suppose, that we probably would ever face. Um, so war is the first one, okay, situations in war. And that's really an emergency situation, okay, it's an emergency situation. Um, I'm also being taken, it's interesting this, I'm being taken back now into the past as well. And I'm seeing like a bomber plane in the sky um, over um, somewhere like London. It feels like it's the Blitz or something like that in London. Um, and for some reason, um, and I know this is true, people said that there would be like one or two houses that somehow were kept standing and the rest were all demolished and nobody really understood why. Again, whether that person inside that house was actually consciously using an invisibility cloak or whether, more likely, they were doing it unconsciously. I'll come to this. Um, I'm being shown that for a reason, because the thing with invisibility cloaks is that this is a re-remembering of something you already know. You already know how to do this in an emergency situation. I am just reminding you. I'm reminding you and I'm reminding you of the power and the responsibility that comes with it. Um, okay, so let's get back to other appropriate uses. Um, a lot of people who do remote viewing would, again, whether they're conscious or unconsciously doing it, they are cloaked. So they go into particular situations, they remote view situations, countries, people, um, and they are by all intents and purposes invisible. Now, what Metatron was saying to me about this is he gave me the example of going to somewhere like um, the island that lots of celebrities in the past went to. I'm not going to say the name of it. You all know the island, just in case this video would get flagged for saying that name. Um, but the island beginning with E. And say you remote viewed that. Um, now, you might be able to do that. I'm not suggesting you do that, by the way, because there's a big but. Um, you might be invisible. You might be able to see things. But once you've seen things, you can't get them out of their, your mind, is what Metatron is saying. He's saying uh, something like remote viewing has consequences in terms of are you ready to really see what you might see? And this again comes into the energy of responsibility and ethics. This isn't a game. This isn't a bit of fun. This isn't something to just sort of try on and have a bit of an experiment and have a bit of fun with. No. Um, if, for example, you use an invisibility cloak in your remote viewing, you might see something that is then burnt into your into your brain. It's burnt into your soul, something that is so distressing. It can be as as much as getting a PTSD reaction from it. So again, let's have our eyes really open to why we would use one for what purposes um, and also after effects of doing so. 
So people that are serious remote viewers, and I'm talking about people that maybe work for governments, things like that, not for entertainment, um, they do so for a reason. Um, and they would be trained military style to be able to also deal with the consequences of what they see. So, uh, but anyway, remote viewing would be one example of using an invisibility cloak. I've also put down detective work, psychic sleuthing. Now, I would include myself in that. I have jokingly called myself the uh, spiritual detective from time to time, just because it, that's what it feels like a lot of the a lot of the time when I go into particular cases. So one would be, for example, the Idaho Four case, the Brian Koberger case something that's quite dark, something that at the time I was called to look at for a particular reason. Um, I was shielded, yes, protected, yes. But also if I'd wanted to go any deeper down into that grim rabbit hole, I would have used an invisibility cloak to do so. OK, so detective work, psychic sleuthing would be another reason to maybe put one on from time to time. The example of bullying I've mentioned, and I would like to talk a little bit more about that. A common question from a lot of you is, can we put one on a child or can we put one on someone that we love? This is a slightly grey area, I have to be honest, because we have the energy of free will that also comes into play. Are you overriding somebody's free will if you were to do that? Um, again, be interested in your comments on this. Let's all learn from each other's perspectives on it. Um, what I'm being told here is that there are appropriate situations when you can, but again, it can't be a free for all where we do it for every particular situation, every particular eventuality. And also what Metatron's saying is you can't do it if it's actually coming from you. So say, for example, you're an overprotective mother. And every time your child, and that can include a grown up child or a teenager or a young adult, goes out into the world and you're fearful that something is going to happen, that's actually your stuff. It's not necessarily their stuff. It's also not necessarily their reality. So you have to look at that. OK, you can't just use it to help you feel better about your unprocessed fears Um which might be real, but also might be imagined. OK, so I have a mother that's very overprotective. And if every time she was throwing an invisibility cloak onto me, every time I literally left my hometown, I would actually be quite cross about that because that would be it would feel like it would be an invasion of my free will because I don't actually need it. Um, so this is what I mean. It's a murky area. It's a gray, gray area. But there are circumstances, certainly, when it would be appropriate for maybe a parent to do that or anybody that you love to, uh, for a very short period of time and for a very specific purpose, put one on. Um, but you, it's a bit like I keep being shown the energy of Cinderella. You know the story of Cinderella where um, the uh, fairy godmother creates the spell effectively and Cinderella becomes that and she has the wonderful time at the ball. But equally, she's told that the magic only lasts for a certain period of time. And after that, she returns to her former state. And there's a bit of that that's also true with invisibility cloaks. So when you invoke them, whether it's for yourself or whether it's for somebody else, there is a limited time period that they stay active unless you reinvoke them. But again, you shouldn't really be doing that all the time for somebody else for reasons that I've stated. And you should really only be doing it for yourself in the case of an emergency situation. And you have to really ask yourself, how often are we placed in a real emergency situation? Um, if you're living in a war zone, it might be pretty frequent. If you're just on, on what do you class as an emergency situation? OK, so this again goes back to understanding our own drivers, our own fears, our own way of looking at the world. Um, and again, back to the energy of we have to respect the magic that we are evoking with this stuff. Remember also when I say evoking the magic, this is magic that exists within you anyway. This is a power that exists within you anyway. Um, Merlin, Ashtar are just reminding you of this fact. 
So it's not as though you're just conjuring something up from the ethers that doesn't belong to you, that is completely alien to you, excuse the pun. No, this is something that's already there, that is dormant. You're just being reminded of it, okay? So, yes, the example of bullying. Uh, I, I know that this is important to quite a few people that watch, so let me just have a think about this and tune into the guides. With bullying, I also want to put the energy of domestic abuse as well. They're slightly different. Let's cover each one in turn. So bullying um, with children. So as I've already said, if you were to cloak your child in an invisibility cloak every single day so the bullies can't find them, well, it might work, but equally they might be in danger in terms of crossing roads and things. But equally, do you really want your child to be t totally invisible so that they don't have a chance to grow and show who they really are? For the teacher to notice, my goodness, this child's got talent and I'm really going to try and draw that out of them um, for opportunities to be present. I mean, I'm, let's lighten up a bit. I'm being reminded of, you know, we all know the story, you know, back at school days, you know, the kids have to choose each other to go on their teams. And I was always the one that no one wanted. Boo hoo. I've got over it now. But um, unless my friend was in the team, you know, that type of thing. So I wasn't particularly sporty. But imagine if you put an invisibility cloak over your kid and it's like no one wants them in their team, whereas actually they would have been the first one to have been picked. So again, grey area, be careful with it. I think the middle way with it is it could be at break times to invoke it. If there's a particular time when you know your child is particularly susceptible or maybe there's a group of bullies that hang around the school gates, for example, you could do a, um, something where you could just ask the guides to make them a little bit invisible as they walk through the gate or th that type of thing. I mean, you've got to fit it to your own scenario, asking for them to be safe at all times, of course. OK, anything else to say with bullying? I um, feel like I want to go to Merlin here. OK, because he's also saying another reason to not overuse it is because Part of the magic, um, part of the magic of life is them learning how to grow and stand up to, for example, the bullies in their midst or to learn how to deal with it. So if you're always like wrapping them in cotton wool or making them invisible, you're not actually helping them in the long term. So again, short term use, emergency use, um, that type of thing. Uh, I would like to talk about domestic abuse here. This is a big subject and it's a very triggering subject. If any of you that are watching me uh, are suffering it at the moment, I send you my love um, and my strength. Now, what, we'd, what I'd like to say here is I'd like to make the distinction between protection and invisibility cloaks. At the end of the day, invisibility cloaks are a form of protection, but there are other forms of protection that you can invoke as well. I've done lots of videos on that. So it would include things such as the armour of God. It would include working with Archangel Michael. It would include um, uh, dealing with uh, unresolved traumas within yourself that have maybe um, not helped you to uh, get into the situation you're in. That doesn't mean that you're being blamed for the situation you, that you're in. But put it this way... Um, Sometimes people that are with very abusive partners, and particularly if there's a pattern of always being with an abusive partner, it comes from a place of low self-esteem. It comes from a place of childhood wounding. It comes from a place where maybe you feel as though you only deserve that. So working on trying to heal those inner wounds is also important. But again, let's talk about emergency situations. So with regards to domestic abuse, it's quite interesting. What I was shown by spirit is if you're living with a partner 24-7, you can't make yourself invisible 24-7 from somebody that you're living with. What Merlin was talking about is trying to... OK, what I'm being shown here is two people, the, the abuser and the abused. And again, it's not the abused person's fault 
that they are being abused. I'm talking here also particularly about adult situations. So like a big, I don't know, hefty bloke, you know, muscle man taking it out on some little woman here who can't stand up to him um, and also, you know, is frightened by him, that type of situation. Um, it's something along the lines of why he is triggered and obviously that's his stuff, okay? It's not her fault. But why he's triggered is coming from some sort of energy um, or wounding that is within within her that he sees. It might be a reflection. It might not be. And it's something to do with the invisibility cloak helps to just almost like blur that, blur that so that Whatever the trigger is, which would be unjustified anyway, because there's no reason why somebody should be abusing you in the first place. But, okay, put it this way. I'm being given this example. It's quite hard to explain this. Say you've got somebody, he comes home. It's like, where's my meal? You know, I expect my meal to be on the table at a certain hour and it has to look a certain way and it has to be presented a certain way and the potatoes have to be the way I like them and there has to be a certain amount of gravy. And if it's not like that, that's going to be my excuse to, to beat you, basically, okay? Um, it's something along the lines of the charge around that particular trigger point gets removed. That's what I'm being shown. I'm being shown, a. it's like a bomb. And it's like the charge being taken out of the bomb and being deactivated. So that the same situation is playing out that usually would trigger him or her. Of course, women can be abusers as well. Um, but for whatever reason, it doesn't crescendo into violence um, or emotional abuse that it normally would do. So it's as though there's an invisibility cloak around the person that needs the help that just helps to take the charge out of the situation because realistically you're living with them. Um, again, it's short term, it's for emergency use um, because ultimately the guidance from spirit would be to get yourself out of that situation as fast as you can really. Uh, again, I know that's a big subject and I might try and do a whole special on that if it would help people that are watching. OK, um, so let's move on. So those are a few appropriate reasons for using an invisibility cloak. Um, I'm sure there are plenty others, but those are the ones that came to me. Uh, when would it not be appropriate? So I think I've really said it, but let's just repeat you know, just for fun, not respecting it would be one, just for fun, just to, you know, have have a look and see what other people are doing and spying, basically, you know, spying, spying on a partner, seeing what they're up to. Um, uh, that type of thing would not be appropriate. That actually is something that comes back to you tenfold as well. There's karma that comes from behaving like that. Um, and I've, also talked about the dangers of PTSD, seeing something that, you know, uh, you witness as a result of going in somewhere with a cloak on. And that's particularly in the in forms of like meditation, remote viewing. OK. Um, OK, let's just see where we want to go now. I'm going to go to the different methods that we've got for it. Um, should we do that now? Yeah, let's go to the different methods that we've got. Yeah. So I'm going to start with Ashtar. Then we're going to go to Merlin. And there are, at the moment, three or four different methods that I've got sitting here on the table to talk to you about. So let's firstly start with Merlin. Oh, I was going to start with Ashtar. Okay, Merlin's butted in. Let's do Merlin first then. I said he was impatient. Okay. <laughs> Merlin. All right. I thought we were doing Ashtar. Merlin. I haven't got as much on Merlin, so okay. He's kept this in reserves. Uh, I'm going to spray the Merlin spray. This is the Connection and Mentorship Ascended Master Spray, and I'm going to ask him about invisibility cloaks. All right. The first thing he's showing me is... Um, himself remember Merlin is an energy who's just been personified over time but Merlin is an energy um he's shown me himself 
uh, in the woods, furrowed, foraging <laughs> for, I don't know, mushrooms, wildflowers, um, you know, obviously safe mushrooms, uh, things to make potions and lotions and medicines. And it feels as though he's able to <coughs> access places that are sealed off from uh, uh, pu the public. So he's shown me like a public right of way and like a big cross sign. You get this a lot in the UK, lots of places that are sealed off. You can't go there. It's not a public footpath. So he's showing me with his invisibility cloak on and it's as though he's it's quite funny. He's hopping over all of these fences and styes, as we call them in the UK. Styles, rather. Styes? Styles? I'm not sure. But anyway, I'm seeing the, oops, sorry, I'm seeing the gateway, you know, the gate. And yes, he's hopping across them um, to forage, basically, and access places that he needs to access. This also includes wells and water, uh, sacred sites. Um, so he's saying it's quite useful. I'm being taken to Glastonbury now and I'm being taken to some of the wells around there and places that are only open to the public at certain times of the year. Um, or he goes there basically when it's closed to the public. So that's really quite interesting. Um, he's also saying that you can, you can use this yourself as well. Uh, not to sort of um, a trespass, but uh, he's talking about meditation. Okay, so in meditation, in astral travel, you can put on an invisibility cloak and it allows you access to unauthorized areas is what he's saying. And he's got a bit of a chuckle. He's got a, a bit of a chuckle. He's got one of those trugs. You know, I think they're called trugs. You know, the wooden trugs that you collect flowers in. Um because he's saying that the universe is actually open to all. There are no restricted areas. Um, it's man that has put restricted areas onto particular places. So he's reminding you of the portals around the planet that you can access. Um, he's saying some of these portals are guarded. And he says some of these portals are guarded by darker entities as well, um, who know that the light is very strong at these particular places. And they keep you out. They keep you out for a reason um, because they don't want you to experience the magic, the peace, the um, stillness, the beauty, but also what is actually there. So if you've ever been drawn to a particular area um, but haven't been able to go, um, it's like with an astral traveling with this invisibility cloak, gets you into access, access all areas, access all areas. Uh, he's also showing me in terms of astro, he's talking about astral traveling now, uh, the importance of something like an invisibility cloak, because yes, it's protection, but also it makes you invisible to darker entities that are floating around the astral. Um, he says a lot of people can sometimes astral travel. Again, it might be even unconscious. You do it just before you're drifting off to sleep. Your defenses are down, as it were. And you can pick up all sorts of little bugs and stuff and um, uh, gremlins and uh, or worse when you astral travel if you aren't properly protected. So again, using an invisibility cloak helps you to be able to travel to all areas, but also to be safe doing so. But again, he's not advising that you go to the darker corners of the universe or to places where the darkness festers. Um, because even though, you, again, you've got the invisibility cloak on, um, it's not good for your soul to basically witness uh, stuff that takes place in these darker portals. Um, okay. Right, so Merlin, invisibility cloaks. Anything else that you want to say at this point? So he's talked about astral travelling. Right, so... Merlin's guidance or Merlin's technique for invisibility cloaks to me feels much more like camouflage, I want to call it. He's showing me nature, you know, and how particular animals or birds um, or beasts are able to blend into their environment to the point that you can't actually really see them. Um, also, you know, if you think about the army, they do that as well. They camouflage themselves so that they can't be seen, it, whether it's a desert, a, a jungle. You know, they wear the gear with the um, the vegetation on the top of their head. I'm not suggesting you do that, but <laughs> it's just the fact that that's the analogy I'm being given. So for Merlin, 
invisibility cloak seems to be linked into the energy of camouflage. It's about merging more into the background. Okay, it's merging into the background. Now, he's saying that, again, there is a scale of this. There's a scale of merging into the background. He's showing me at a very basic everyday level the energy of a wallflower. Everybody understand that expression? So a wallflower, somebody that just merges into the background. You're at a party. Um, people notice all the very loud people with, I don't know, brightly coloured clothes or loud mouths or the latest hairstyle, whatever it is, you know. Um, but there's there's other people that are there that's almost like you didn't even notice they were at the party because they've just they've become so much like the wallflower that they're just like standing with their back against the wall, actually hoping nobody does see them. Somebody that's very shy or doesn't really want to be there. You know, we've probably all done it to a degree. It's just like I just want to merge into the background and just don't notice me. Thank you very much. You're actually on the scale of the invisibility cloak when you're doing that. You just don't realize you're doing it. OK, so. Um, but yeah, going back to camouflage. So let's let's ask him about camouflage. Camouflage. I'm hearing that song, camouflage. Let's have a song reference. Um, oh, what was it called? Camouflage. Let me just get the song up. Hold on. Camouflage song. Camouflage song. Oh, camouflage. <laughs> Uh, oh. oh, is the song Camouflage based on a true story? Yes, it's well known that Marines in the 1960s were trained in the art of astral projection, particularly post-mortem. Post-mortem astral projection, or PMAP, was in fact the inspiration for force ghosts in George Lucas's Star Wars saga. Wow, okay. Um, well, I don't know if that was the song I was thinking about, because there's also another song from 1986, which is more my era, called Camouflage by Stan Ridgway. But anyway, okay, let's... Uh, Maybe maybe I'll just link the song below because um, it says, I was a PFC on a search patrol hunting Charlie down. It was in the Jungle Wars of 65. My weapon jammed and I got stuck way out and all alone and I could hear the enemy moving in close outside. Just then I heard a twig snap and I grabbed my empty gun and I dug in scared while I counted down my fate. And then a big marine, a giant and a pair of friendly eyes appeared there at my shoulder and said, wait. When he came in close beside me, he said, don't worry, son, I'm here. If Charlie wants to tangle now, he'll have he'll have two to dodge. I said, well, thanks a lot. I told him my name and asked him his. And he said, the boys just call me camouflage. Woohoo, camouflage. Things are never quite the way they seem. Woohoo, camouflage. I was awfully glad to see this big Marine. Well, I was going to ask him when he came from, when, he, when we heard the bullets fly, coming through the brush and all around our ears. It was then I saw this big Marine, a lot of fire in his eyes, and it was strange, but suddenly I forgot my fears. When he led me out of the danger, I saw my camp. This is a song lyrics. When he led me out the danger, I saw my camp and waved goodbye. He just winked at me from the jungle and then was gone. And when I got back to my HQ, I told them about my night and the battle I'd spent with a big marine named Camouflage. When I said his name, a soldier gulped and a medic took my arm and led me to a green tent on the right. He said, you may be telling true boy, but this here is camouflage, and he's been right here since he passed away last night. In fact, he's been here all week long. But before he went, he said sem simper fleur and said his only wish was to save a young marine caught in a barrage. 
Okay, so, I mean, that feels as though it's a song about, obviously, divine protection in a different way. Um, I'll I'll put the link below and you can look at that yourself, but I'm definitely being given that song. And obviously there's a Star Wars reference there that I don't understand that you can comment about below as well. Please help us all out. Okay, Merlin, anything else before we uh, go on? So putting on an invisibility cloak, Merlin, what would that look like? Camouflage, camouflage is what he's saying. And it's going to be different for, for every situation that you're in. Um, you just asked to blend into the background to such an extent that you're not seen. Um, uh, and it's interesting because, you see, I would have thought that Merlin would be the one to say, no, I'm just going to give you the cloak because Merlin's all about cloaks. He's often shown with a cloak. But I have to give you what I'm being given to give you, which is he's talking more about camouflage here than anything, uh, for whatever reason. Hmm. I feel as though there's a missing piece that I'm not quite getting. with Merlin okay he's saying the missing piece is because you're doubting the magic you're doubting the ability you're, you're you've gone into your mind too much you've gone into your headspace which is like you're talking about camouflage well tell me how to do it he's saying this is magic this is magic he says listen to the song as well OK, I'm going to move on because I've got a lot to get through and uh, we might come back to that. Let's go to Ashtar now. And uh, what does Ashtar want to say? So I tuned in yesterday to Ashtar and what he showed me was quite interesting. Again, it wasn't necessarily a cloak that you put on. Now, if you want to put a cloak on, either with Merlin or Ashtar, of course do. If that's how you want to envisage it, do it. Remember, it's just energy. But I was shown something else again. What I was shown was a visualization of, say you're in a situation and you you want an invisibility cloak put on or you want to be invisible, emergency situation. It's as though there is a dissolving of the physical self. I've written down, visualize dissolving the physical shell that the world sees, but not the core essence. Um so let me repeat that. You visualize dissolving the physical shell the world sees, but not the core essence. It's a bit um, Star Trek. You know, when they used to beam me up, Scotty, and beam me down, Scotty, um, you know, they used to stand on that, wherever it was, that platform in the ship, and they would be beamed down, and you would see their physical self just sort of starting to, like, evaporate. It just sort of dissolved in this light. I think, I don't know whether it used to go from their head to their toes, but that's what I'm being shown. Um, so, in fact, beam, beam, beam me down, Scotty. <laughs> this is that energy. Uh, that's the first thing that Ashtar showed me, okay? So, but it's important that you're not dissolving your whole self. You're just dissolving for a very short period of time the physical self that the world sees, okay? But you don't dissolve the core essence, which remains. Um, so I found that that was very strongly coming through. Obviously, when you then want to rematerialize, as it were, and reappear, you do it in reverse. So when you're taking it off or asking for the magic to be reversed, you imagine from your feet upwards. So from your feet upwards, you start to come back, okay? So it's like this spiral of light comes back. Because um, essentially you are light. We're all light beings. So what you're doing is you are just switching off that that visible light, the physical self, and, and then you're putting it back on again when you need to. Um, okay, so that's number one. The second one, um, I'm not going to say who you are, but you know who you are, somebody that follows me, somebody who helps me from time to time as well, who herself is cloaked uh, to do the work that she does. Um, I won't even say what that work is because it's not anyone's business really. But anyway, um, she reached out to me when I was going to do this video and she said she'd been shown this. 
This is another technique coming from the Galactics, which is the zip zip. But many of you might know this. So um, effectively, it's imagining a zip that you have from your crown. Your crown is here down to your earth star chakra, which is beneath your feet. And it's as though when you're wanting to um, deep, I, I would do it this way. I might be going off on a little bit of a tangent here to the person who gave me this, but this is what I'm feeling we need to do with the zip. So again, dematerialization, i.e. invisibility. Um, you take the zip down. Let me go to Ashtar. Tell me about the zip. <laughs> Tell me about the zip. Okay. Okay, it's in, done with intention, he's saying. Um, okay. Right, put it this way. When we are visible, which is the vast majority of time, um, I'm being shown the analogy of a mother, okay? So a mother, when it's cold, you've all seen yourself do it, other people do it, you zip your child up, don't you? You put them in their coat, their woolly coat, you zip them up, you put the hood over their head, and you say, out you go into the world, you know, you're, you're ready. So becoming invisible seems to be the opposite, which is to do with unzipping. So you unzip. Oh, that's interesting. And then he's saying what you do is you step out of your meat suit, <laughs> the meat suit, your shell, your physical shell, just temporarily. And, oh, it's so funny. I never knew Ashtar had such a sense of humour. He's shown me himself here as a cloakroom attendant. So it's like you unzip, you step out. Okay, so what is r remaining out is just the essence of who you are. Okay, your soul light, your heart, all of it the internalness of you, but the meat suit, the physical self, the hair, all of this, it's just you step out of it and it's as though Ashtar, Ashtar temporarily takes care of it, puts it onto this, like it's like a cloakroom I'm being shown with all of these different hangers. I know it's a bit gross, but that's what I'm being shown. Uh, it's no blood or anything. It's just, it's just, that's what I'm being shown, okay? And then when you need it again, he just hands it back to you and then that's when you go back out and you're visible, so when you've taken it off, you're in, it's like they can't see you. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so that's another one. As I say, go with the version that works for you. Some will work, some won't work. Um, the other one I got today is I was drawn to a pack of cards. I didn't know why, but I pulled this card and it's the jack in the box. So again, another way that you could imagine invisibility working is you become like the jack in the box. So you literally imagine that you are um, going into the box. The box, which is a hexahedron, the cube, is to do with safety. It's your foundation. It's as though you imagine that that box around you, you go into it, the lid gets put onto it, you can breathe in it, you can move in it, um, but the box itself is invisible, okay? The box itself is invisible, so you're still in there. And then when the danger has passed, it's like the jack-in-the-box springs back up, and there you are, okay? Right, um, we're going to get to some Q&As in a moment, but I also want to just talk a little bit about Ashtar and why the Galactics use cloaking. So waking up this morning to a very obviously cloaked ship... Uh, outside my window. I open my windows every morning. It's not a normal cloud formation for me to see at all. In fact, it was extraordinarily beautiful. The um, There was a slight mist and fog and it was just rising and evaporating off the field in front of the house. Uh, there was the, this great big cloaked ship in the sky. It was platinum sky, which is platinum is my colour for Ashtar. Um, it was just absolutely extraordinary. And I was like, oh, there you are. But the thing is, he was saying, you know it's us. Even though we're cloaked, you know it's us. It's us. Other people would look at that sky and see absolutely nothing. So, um, but it's because you are part of us. You recognize yourself as part of us. Um, so a lot of people wouldn't have even seen that. But anyway, Ashtar and why the Galactics use cloaking. Um, he says that, I've written this down, he says, we don't abuse our surveillance powers. 
Um, we work for the highest good and we are not on one side. You see, the truth is that the Galactics are encloped ships around many particular places in our world and have been for goodness knows how many years and will continue to be so. Um, they're there. They are lurking. They are watching. But they're not snooping, okay? They're not doing it just for fun. They're not surveilling. They're not using surveillance to get one over on somebody else, to trade information to this part party over here. You know, um, but that's what human beings do, is what he's saying. That's what human beings do. That's what governments do. I'm going to spy on you and I'm going to access information and then I'm going to trade it, you know, or I'm going to blackmail or I'm going to use it against you. Um, that's not what we do, is what he's saying. So uh, what we do is we are working for the highest good. We're not working for any side. We are not abusing our powers. We are there just as he's saying security forces, security forces just making sure that we don't um, obliterate ourselves, basically, um, and that they're there as protect protectors. Okay. I'm going to go to a few questions now. Um, let's just do this. So let's just go. I'm going to get through as many as I possibly can. Uh, somebody says, what to do about doubts that it's working? Um, okay. And I've basically answered that already. And I've said that if you doubt that it's working, whichever method you use, whether it's a form of imagining that you're camouflaged, whether you're imagining that you're in some invisible box, whether you are unzipping yourself, stepping out of your meat suit, as it were, whether you are dematerializing, as in Star Trek, whether it is that you actually want to put on an invisibility cloak. I mean, this was the beautiful picture that I found. I can't credit whoever it was because I don't know who it was. Oh, that was a bit of Freddie Mercury, the invisible man. <laughs> that was the lovely... Uh, image of the invisibility cloak that I just found somewhere. And, you know, that's beautiful. If you want to envisage that, envisage that. The thing about this is there's no right or wrong way, really. It's whatever works for you. Magic, um, magic can be, uh, magic has many different formulas is what Merlin is saying. Um, but yes, if you start to doubt it, then you are going to weaken the power of it. And that's true of anything. So Metatron's giving me the example of prayer. If you pray, but you doubt it's even being heard, you doubt that it's going to do any good, you doubt that it's even worth bothering, um, you do weaken the power of your pet prayer. So magic like prayer, you have to have a strength of conviction. You have to believe in it for it to work as effectively as it possibly can. Um Yeah, will it work in cases of doubt when a person tends to overthink things through? You're going to weaken it, is what I've just basically what I've just said. Yes, you're going to weaken it. Um, I don't know what else to say, guys. I mean, the analogy I'm being given is prayer. You know, at the end of the day, the spiritual path is one of trust and faith, and we cannot get away from that. So when you're working with the energy of magic, you're still going to come back to trust and faith. Um, do you trust it? Maybe it comes also into do you trust the guides that you're working with? Do you trust Metatron? Do you trust Ashtar? Do you trust Merlin? Um, only you can answer that. This isn't going to be for everybody, but for those people that do, um, then absolutely this can work. Um, Can the invisibility cloak be worn to make us invisible to germs? Um, also EMF pollutants. Now, this is really interesting because I was wondering this today. I'm going to ask them. I was also thinking, don't want to bring this into the world, but, you know, we're living with the spectre of nuclear uh, accident at the moment because it won't be obliteration of the planet. But equally, we know that we've already had Fukushima in my lifetime. We've also had um, Chernobyl in my lifetime. So absolutely, nuclear accidents can happen. And we've also got madmen playing with nuclear weapons. So can there be damage? Yes, there can. 
what would happen in the event of some form of contamination with that? And I'm going to ask them about that because I am thinking that absolutely it can form a form of shield whereby potentially the particles cannot find you. That's going to take a lot of trust and faith. And that's something that's very easy to ridicule. And, and I don't be so bloody ridiculous, Amanda. But I'm going to say it anyway, because I'm feeling as though it's possible. Why would it not be possible? Now, let's see. Um, let's go to both of them. <laughs> let's see what Ashtar's got to say first. Right. Yeah, he's saying it is possible. He, he's shown me the example of Chernobyl and people going into Chernobyl who have the big, um, like, I don't know what they're called, you know, the radiation suits and they're fully, you know, literally they're like a space suit, isn't it? And um, they're able to go into a contaminated area and clean it up. Um, So, yes, there is a degree of possibility with that. Hell, it's worth a go, guys, if it ever came to it. I don't know about you, but I would definitely be trying to invoke it in that scenario. God forbid. Um, not that we want to bring it in. Cancel, clear, delete. So he's shown me the cleanup operation and, and the suits that people use, um, which have a degree of making them invisible to the contaminants that would hurt them. Okay, so that's what I'm being shown by Ashtar. Let's see what Merlin has to say about that. I mean, this is worst case possible scenario that hopefully we'll never need. Talk about going in the deep end. Um, invisibility suits. You see, I'm talking suits here. I'm not talking cloaks. I'm talking suits. Invisibility suits in the event of nuclear radiation. Yeah. Okay. So Merlin's given me the example again of something like an invisibility suit. But again, it's as though what he's been showing me is like radiation, which feels almost more like rain, but it's as though it, it just drips off the suit. It's like dripping off the suit. And then unfortunately it's going into mother earth who then has to transmute it. But she has a longer lifespan to be able to transmute it. Uh, a human being, if they get contaminated by nuclear radiation, it affects you quickly. You know, we've only got however many decades we've got here anyway, whereas the earth is always going to be here. She's got more time to transmute it. Um, so M Merlin's given me the example of this suit. It feels like an invisibility suit. And it's as though it all just drops off it. It's as though, again, it's just dropping off it. But it's got to go somewhere. It's going into the earth. So, um, mm, okay. So that's as far as I want to go with that because hopefully we're not going to need it for that purpose. But you talked about germs. Um, yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, absolutely. I, I believe that's possible. Can it make you invisible? But, okay, one thing I need to say here at this point of this juncture, and this comes into ethics. Oh, no, not ethics. It comes into... Oh, so that's my daughter. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Luce. Um, it, it comes into... Sorry, I got distracted. What am I trying to say? Okay. Bottom line, if you are meant to pass over in any situation you're going to pass over. All right. Um, an invisibility cloak can't help you avoid death if it is your time. Now you might say, well, what's the blinking point of wearing one then? If I'm in a war zone and you're saying, if it's my time, I'm going anyway. Because I believe that, yes, you have a defined time when you're going to go, but there are windows. And anybody that's been with dying people have often seen this. There are windows. Um, I was also given this example by Metatron earlier today, and we've heard this in the news many times over the years. Somebody, for example, who might have been caught up in, I don't know, the tsunami or 9-11, but somehow managed to escape. 
or they were in some terrible train accident, but they escaped with their life, whereas most people didn't. But then a year later, they die in another tragedy, okay? Another train crash or another aeroplane crash or something like that. You think, my goodness, what's that about? So it was their time to go, but they dodged a window. But they also dodged a window for a very deep soul reason, which was in that year that they then had, or a month or a week or longer, they were able to maybe tie up karmic lessons, say what needed to be said to somebody. I love you. I'm sorry. You know, I, I forgive you. Tying up soul lessons, karmic lessons. It could be that the second chance that they got, the window that they didn't go through, but it gave them a little bit more time, but there was still a window coming up, allowed them to, I don't know, become a better person, to... Um, just tidy up is what Metatron's saying, to tidy up before they eventually go through the big window, which was non-negotiable, okay? So, yes, yeah, so it's important to remember this when we're talking about uh, using an invisibility cloak to dodge situations in war or disease or um, anything else. If, there's a re if, if you're meant to go, you go. And also, going back to the energy of... Um, <sighs> It's very difficult to say these things without triggering people, but I just got to have to go for it on this video because hopefully you're at the level where you're going to get what I'm saying. Most people do. But say you're in a situation of domestic abuse. As hard as this is to hear, sometimes there are situations in our life that we are meant to go through because we have signed up to learn what it is to stand up for ourselves. And so if we have to learn in this lifetime, what does it look like for me to stand up for myself and to say no or to start over again? I am going to be given situations and people that help me learn that lesson. And that's a very violet pill thing to say, but it's what I believe. So again, um, using an invisibility cloak over and over again to dodge the lesson isn't going to help you. OK. Right. Um, Someone's saying here that, um, and I've, I've noted this as well when I've used it in the past and I've forgotten to maybe take it off again, uh, you get people bumping into you all the time, <laughs> you know, walking down the street and it's literally like, I'm, I'm invisible. I can't, everyone's just walking into me. Check yourself when that's happening, that you haven't unintentionally put it on or activated it. Okay. Um, Can I put an invisible cloak on loved ones without their permission? I think I've answered that for earlier on in the video. Yes, you can, but for what reason and for only for a short time and not to contravene their free will. So again, it's short-term use for a specific purpose when it's really needed. Do you need to cleanse the cloak, somebody says? Ashtar's saying no. He's giving me the analogy of quartz, clear quartz, which is self-cleansing. So the very nature of a cloak, for example, let's go back to the cloak, it's a self-cleansing cloak. It's like crystal, uh, it's like quartz. You don't have to cleanse quartz all the time like you do other crystals. It's self-cleansing. Um, and these other methods that I've mentioned to you, like dematerializing, um, that, that isn't, a, that's not, the question isn't appropriate anyway, because you're not cleansing anything, you're just dematerializing. Um, let's see if there's any more. Can you use it if you have abusive partner? I've answered that, I think, as best as I could in this video anyway. Should we use it while doing energy healing or asking for the light and protection is enough? I can't see why you would need to use it in energy healing on a standard person. Um, having said that, I suppose it depends what you're dealing with, doesn't it? If you are releasing um, entities, if, you, if your work is involved in <coughs> helping people with, I don't know, dark magic and... Uh, 
uh, voodoo and curses and things like that. And I've spoken about that before because actually I believe it's an inner belief, but you're still releasing something that's dark, whether you believe it's external or internal, something that's attached. Um, okay, what Metatron's saying is, yes, you could use it in that scenario. I know I've just contradicted myself, but I'm learning with you. He's saying, yes, you could use it in that scenario. And he's giving me this example. So healers out there will understand what I'm saying. When you are releasing something from somebody and it's very heavy and dark, if you're not fully protected and clear yourself, it, you you can get you, it can attach to you, okay. Which is why it's very important after every uh, healing session to make sure that you cleanse yourself, you wash yourself off of whatever you've been you know dealing with. But equally, an invisibility cloak um, makes it that whatever is being released can't even see you to attach itself to. But ultimately, again, good spiritual hygiene should really be the fact. What I used to do when I was doing hands-on healing with people is I would create a vortex within the room and I would ask that anything that is to be released in this session by me or by the person that I'm healing, I would imagine like a violet vortex above, above me and for it to be sucked out of the room, away from the street, away from my town. I would actually direct it out to sea or out to an element where it could be transmuted back into light. So as far away from me as possible. But that's so that's what I did. So I don't really feel as though I needed an invisibility cloak in that situation. But everybody heals in different ways. So for me, it would more be about creating the vortex and just sucking, taking it out straight out of the room, away from me, away from the healer, all of it. OK. Someone says, how do I get one in the first place? Not judging your comment there, um, this particular person. But can you see that that's not understanding energy. Okay. Other people are saying, well, what color can I have it in? Where do I get one from? Um, this is energy. It's energy. It's already, it's, it's, <sighs> am I explaining it? Okay. Hopefully I am. Give me a, give me a, give me a thumbs up if I'm doing all right. <laughs> um, what do they feel like on or when someone else wears them? Can, uh, do they come in my size? Oh, that's probably a joke. Okay. But what do they feel like on? You shouldn't be able to feel it on. It's not about feeling it on. Um, I mean, maybe if, maybe the question there is, why do you feel as though you need to feel it on? Is that because you doubt that it's on unless you can feel it? Yeah? Uh, it's like prayer. Again, you say a prayer, you send it off. I believe that it's working. I believe that God has heard it. I believe that a sandal phone's taken it up. I don't need to have evidence of it. I know it. We're back to trust and faith. Someone says, I cloak my car when it's parked in a dodgy place. Yeah, that's that's a good good thing to do. Although, is it? <laughs> I mean, again, there's, there's not a rule book here in terms of um, the rule. What I'm trying to say is there's not one written way to do this because I can, I'm being shown straight away different scenarios. Say you're, you've parked your car in a very quiet little dark street and there's hardly any traffic that ever goes down it but there's I don't know lots of dodgy people walking by cloaking it yeah I can understand why you might do that but then again imagine if there's I don't know a great big lorry that comes down the road and it doesn't see your little car with its cloak and it just goes straight into it so you know it's not clear cut a lot of this stuff I think more than anything, what's coming to me is a lot of this work on invisibility cloaks is coming to, it, it's an, it's the art of trusting your higher self to guide you. Sure, you've got Metatron here. You've got, I love the way he's inserted himself into this video. You've got Metatron here. You've got Ashtar here. You've got Merlin here. You can talk to them. You can call on them. You can ask them for guidance. But you can also, you've got to trust your own common sense and your own higher self. And every situation is going to be different, okay? Um, and that's why I think we need a discussion on this. Um can there be rules set up for the cloak? For example, if I put my cloak on my seven-year-old when he goes to school, can we ins can we set the intention that he's only invisible for those who want to do harm? I wouldn't want him to get overlooked for good things. That's a really good way of explaining it, uh, Cindy. Thank you for that. Uh, yes, I see no reason. It's, um, 
uh, I feel, I'm not sure which one's speaking. They're all speaking. I've got Metatron here now. He's saying you can program it. You program it. So if it's a cloak, and I understand that that's an easy way for a lot of people to visualize it, you put your cloak on. Uh, yeah, you can program it. So I love that. Yes. So he's invisible to those who want to do harm, but not to those who want to do good things, you know, with him. I mean, it's a bit like the silver crown chakra spray that we sell. That I've always imagined as a filter. It's a filter that allows through what is beneficial and good, and it keeps out all the rest of the crud, you know? Anything that's detrimental to your energy is not allowed through your crown. That's the energy of silver. Um... Oh, I like this. Thank you very much. Can the cloak be made selective of people, like invisible to negative energies people while being visible to loving positive vibes people? Yeah, yeah. You see, I think that's what I was trying to say earlier. I knew that that was a ship out there today. And I know probably everybody else in my street would think I'm a raving bloody lunatic for even saying that and would just wouldn't have seen it. But it's because... I'm the same. It's this. It's my vibration. It's my soul tribe. I knew that what that was. Other people wouldn't have even seen it. Um, I was visible to them, and they were visible to me, because they chose to for me to see it. Yeah, but to everybody else, that ship this morning was completely and utterly invisible. So yes, I agree with what you've just said there. I also like that you put this. You said. Um, can it change its stripes depending on the type of animal approaching? You see, what you didn't realise you've actually said there is is the Merlin uh, technique, which is camouflage. Um, so the Merlin technique, the more I think about it, he's talking about camouflage, but maybe the cloak, maybe the cloak is just camouflage. Maybe it's a camouflage cloak. I guess it is, isn't it? So the cloak's going to be different based on where you are. If you're in the middle of the blinking desert, it's going to be sandy coloured. And it's not just over your shoulders. It goes all the way over you. OK, all the way over you. Um, you know, you've got some room to be able to breathe in it, but you can't see anything. Is there a length of time that we shouldn't go beyond with the cloak on? Um, that's situational. I can't answer that. It depends on the situation. Um Certainly you wouldn't want to cloak yourself every single day, would you? You just wouldn't. It's from an emergency. But if it's an emergency, it's until the emergency is passed, until the danger is passed. OK, just trying to find any other quote, uh, uh, comments. Uh, is it safe to use over a house? Yeah, absolutely. You can you can cloak your house. Um. Why would you want to do that? I suppose if you're going away on holiday and maybe you live in an area where there's a lot of burglaries happening, you can ask for an invisibility cloak to put on your house for the time that you're away. But again, I would program it, you know? So, for example, I don't know. If, if there's somebody that during the period that you were going to be going away that actually still needed to have access to the house, um, that that would be okay. You know, it's got to be on a case-to-case -case basis. Oh, this is a good one. I like this. This must be from somebody in Canada. It says, can the cloak be placed over a tent in grizzly bear country? That, that feels a really good idea to me. Um, I like that. Yes, absolutely. And I would... Uh, again, a mixture of that's a mixture of the box technique, Jack in the box. I am safe in my box, but equally the box is camouflaged, maybe. Um, and I don't know if there's a particular scent that bears don't like. I guess there is. I would probably also cloak the tent. I would Im imagine that the tent or visualize that the tent was cloaked in that smell as well to invade them as well. So you can double up on things. Um, this is something I have been subconsciously doing and it's almost gotten me into wrecks and often gets me ignored when I don't want to be. 
Um, yeah, exactly. So I think that's what I've been trying to express, that you need to know what you're doing. And put it this way, if you believe in the power of this and you believe in the power of magic and you believe it's actually able to keep you invisible in a, a very difficult situation like war, you have to respect the fact that you also have the responsibility to switch it off. Yeah? We don't muck about with this stuff. So how are you going to remember to switch it off if you've put one on yourself, for example? Well, most of us walk around with, I haven't got one on today, but watches that beep at us every, you know, half an hour. You haven't done your 200 steps, all this type of stuff. It's all quite possible to set a little alarm or a little reminder on your phone that everyone's carrying around with them anyway. You know, 6 p.m., switch it off. None of this is rocket science. <clears throat> Um, are the crystals or stones that help the invisibility cloak? Right, now this is a really interesting one. And again, interested in what you have to say, guys. There is a crystal that I'm being called to for this video. And it's it's quite unusual. Um, it's titanium aura quartz. Now, titanium aura. If you look up the meaning of titanium aura, let's just have a look at my book. It talks about the fact that it's very good. It's a very good aid for helping to see auras. Um, helps to see auras. Let me just read what it says. Now we're talking about invisibility, not seeing more. But let's just go with this. It says titanium aura quartz is a powerful aid to seeing auras. Look at the colours in a titanium aura. Can you see that if I put it in front of my face? Don't know if it's focusing in on it or not. Um, look at the colours in a titanium aura and then at the space around the head and shoulders of the person you are with. The colours around the head will transmit themselves as accurate impressions about the character of other people. Useful when you are unsure of someone. Um, a titanium aura shaped as a point will energize and empower your own aura when you feel fragmented, tired or dispirited. Um, hold titanium aura when life is dark. If you're facing bankruptcy, re repossession, unemployment or serious illness, basically heavy, dark times. I'm being given titanium aura here. Um let me go to Merlin on this for crystal help with titanium aura. Why? Why that? It's linked into seeing auras. So why would we use it for invisibility? I'm just there's so much energy it's like quite overwhelming oh. <clears throat> oh boy guys I I'm just hearing it works I mean, I literally, it's made me speechless. The combination of Merlin <clears throat> and the titanium aura has made me feel speechless. Um, it feels as though it just stops time. Um, again, you wouldn't want to do this all the time. You don't want to be out of sync with time. It just feels very protective and it feels as though it helps to I'm being shown the aura and it's as though the aura is just <sighs> F 
folding in on itself a little bit. I mean, the truth is that when you are very visible, okay, let's go the other extreme. When you're very visible and you're out there and you want people to see you and notice you and here I am, here is my light, and your aura's huge, your aura's huge. But with invisibility, we're doing the other thing, aren't we? We're making the aura smaller, closer to the body. I'm being shown the energy of an animal, a little, I don't know, a little hedgehog I'm being shown, um, tight into a little ball. It feels as though the titanium aura helps to do that. Yeah, of course it does. Because it's not, so it really, really interesting because normally you would use this crystal to expand your aura, <clears throat> to expand your aura, <clears throat> to help you reach higher. Um, but it can also do the opposite, but it's you have to program it. You have to program it. So for me, I would actually probably get a piece um, that is specifically for the purpose of helping you with this whole subject of invisibility, okay? Um, this is a good, good piece I've got here, okay? Because it's got a point on it. So I'm giving you that crystal. Uh, I think I've answered a lot of these other questions. Uh, I'm not sure if this would help. What about when we have doubts and fears on how to remove and letting go both? How to remove? Yeah, I mean... How do we use it without abusing it and using it out of fear? I'm going to throw that question back to you, you know, with love. I have a question, please. How do we use it without abusing it um, and using it out of fear? I mean, isn't this true of everything? Isn't this true of everything linked into a lot of the spiritual path? Think about your growing light generally your growing wisdom, your growing ability to be able to, I don't know, see through agendas, to um, be able to access angels, galactics, to be able to heal. All of it's about not abusing your power. You know, because we, because other, easily, otherwise, we can just turn towards the darkness. We can use our power in ways which, and become corrupted but yet we don't. And I've got the energy of Jesus coming in. And why don't we? Because we stay in our heart. So if we stay in our heart, we're not going to abuse these powers, are we? Okay. Uh, I think for now, um, we're going to finish in a minute. Let me just make sure there aren't any other questions on Facebook. And I hope you found this session helpful. Um, if I need to do a part two, I'll do a part two. Um, but for now, let's just have one final question. Let's see. There's 122 questions here, so... Mm. How long do they last? We've talked about that. Uh, can they be used to protect from seeing and feeling weird energy, especially before sleep, whilst allowing the lovely energy to still come through? Putting them on before you go to sleep at night. Um, I'm being shown the example of night terrors in children. I think that could be quite a useful um, use for them. If you experience night terrors or you have fears around the night, invisibility there for a set, and I'm being shown the alarm then going off. So it's only for a certain number of hours. Hmm, yeah, I, I can see that that would, that would work. Okay. A lot of the comments seem to be quite similar. So I'm just looking for one final one. Are the cloaks all the same, i.e. if someone is sick and weak and more susceptible to attack, but they find a cloak too strong or heavy for them, can they ask for what they need so it helps them rather than hinder? Um, can a cloak be too strong or heavy for them? 
No. No, because it's like healing. You you receive what you are capable of holding. Someone else has asked about sleeping through the, the night. Would an invisibility cloak help somebody sleep through the night so that you can sleep better and feel safer? Um, would you recommend using an invisibility cloak before or during astral travel? Yes, I've answered these, haven't I? Okay, um... Someone says, I use them sparingly, but they work. Yeah, indeed. What significance does different colour cloaks have? That's, again, we're, get out of the head. It's not about the colour that they are. It's about the energy that they are. I think some people are getting a little bit confused with um, other things, such as, for example, Archangel Michael's blue cloak of protection. This is different. I hope I've explained this as well as I could. Um Let's end with a card and let's see if a card can make any sense. I'm going to pull an animal card, you know, just in honour of Merlin. I've got the Divine Animal Oracle cards here by Stacey DeMarco. Let's see what animal would like to add in anything to this conversation around invisibility cloaks. Armadillo, number seven, armadillo. Right, what's armadillo all about then? Uh, armadillo is about groundedness. Okay, I think actually the armadillo is coming in to remind us of the importance of grounding after using one. But uh, it also talks here about a cape of armadillo. Hold on, I'm going to have to read this. Uh, the animal. Armadillos are distinctive animals because of their leathery armoured shell, an incredible adaptation that has enabled them through a lengthy evolution. The armour is actually overla <coughs> overlapping plates of bone covered with horn called scoots, the scoots are rigid, particularly over the front half of the animal, and typically become more flexible over the back legs and tail. The underneath of the animal is furry and unarmoured. Contra contrary to popular belief, only a few armadillo species actually roll up in a ball if threatened by a predator. Most will attempt to run and find some thick ground plant or stone cover, where they will be very hard to get at. Um, so it's the armadillo shell that we're being talked uh, told about. Armadillo magic is profoundly earth-based and grounded. It's ancient and profound and, be, and can be used when you're feeling off-kilter and unsure. Um, helps to bring stability and power. Uh, the symbology is an old man with a cape of armadillo, shield, armour and claws in the earth. Ah, claws in the earth. So another method then, it's like the armadillo shell. It can be like the armadillo shell, shield, armour and claws in the earth. Okay, right. Well, thank you all very much for listening. I've gone on longer than I thought I was going to, but I hope you've made it to the end of this video. <laughs> hope you found it helpful. Please like and share, and I'll be back soon. I'm hoping to do a video for Lunar Eclipse at the end of the week. Lots of love, everybody. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye for now. Bye.